Welcome to the Unitarian Church in Fall River, where we think religious questions are important, but want to work out our own answers, where we gather to share ideas and support one another. Thank you. 
are standing, let's say together the affirmation, which is in the order of the service. Did you get an order, sir? No, I agree. Okay. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is a sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human being, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus we be covenant with each other and with God. I have one announcement, which is that we're probably going to get a sound system, which which we've needed. Not that it's impossible. I, you can all hear me, right? It's possible to be heard here if one speaks loudly and not too quickly. But almost all of our preachers are used to preaching in churches with sound systems. And even though we, we tell them this is different, um, they just fall into the habit of speaking more softly and quickly. And then lots of us whose hearing isn't all that good anymore miss a lot. Of it. So we're, we're going to get a sound system. Yeah. Who's the preacher next week? Oh, yes. Yeah. That would be me to make an announcement. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Richard, for doing our piece to service. I appreciate that. Rob Ross will be our. Um, Guest minister next week, please come and make you welcome. And uh, David isn't here, but if he were here, he would say <laughs> the Course in Miracles is continuing Friday at 11. And he would say to get the Zilk code, call him at 508 uh, 774. Uh, 1965. Okay. 1965. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would say that. Did he well? Is that great today? Pardon me? Did he well? Is that great today? Uh, he's visiting. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason he feels good. Uh, are there other announcements? For invocation today, I wanted to say that uh, a lot of people come to Unitarian Universalist churches because they're kind of estranged from the religion of their upbringing and they're they're excited that you can come here and leave behind a lot of religious dogma that you find either not useful or harmful but the trouble is some people who come to our congregations are so boisterous in their religious house cleaning they're so elated that they don't have to believe in things and they're so loud about it that they give people the impression that that's expected, that we expect people to turn their back on their religious heritage. And what I wanted to say is no, in a Unitarian Universalist church, you're also free to keep everything, everything from your religious past that's still useful to you. Everything, everything. My meditation today, I don't have a prayer, but I have a meditation. It's, uh, it's the Universalist Declaration of Faith. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, related to what I was just talking about. Uh, UU churches, we have, a whole, we have a whole range of people in our congregations with different religious backgrounds. And uh, in, in the average congregation, and I think this is probably true of this one, we have uh, we have people who still are thinking of themselves as Christians in a very important way. I mean, they may not have kept every single aspect of their Christian upbringing, but still they, they think of themselves as Christians. And then at the, at the other extreme, we have people who call themselves humanists who ignore everything supernatural and just focus on human life and its problems. And the universalists, were really skillful at coming up 
with, uh, they call it a declaration of faith. It sounds like a creed, but at the end they said, you don't have to believe it. <laughs> it, was, it was a creed-like thing that they denied was a creed. At the end they said, neither this nor any other statement shall be imposed as a creedal test, right? Just so everybody understands that. You don't have to pass a test to come to our congregation. But they, they, um, they did a really good job at, at pleasing, at, at making a big tent, at pleasing the most Christian of the Christians and the most humanist of the humanists at the same time. Their declaration of faith began by asserting um, their belief in God as love, as love. And the Christians, of course, were happy about the affirmation of God. And the humanists could say, hi, <laughs> the humanists could say, well, there's a God that exists. I mean, love exists, love exists, you know. Uh, and then they, they talked about Jesus as a spiritual leader. And certainly Jesus was a spiritual leader. And that, that was perfectly acceptable to the humanists, but the Christians were pleased. And then there, there was a point about the supreme worth of every human personality, which is where our, the first UU principle comes from, the, the, uh, inherent, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Well, that's just a rephrasing of this thing from the Universalist Declaration. And then they said, they had five points. Then they said uh, that, that they had faith in the authority of truth, known or to be known. So they were asserting a confidence in reason, and, and but keeping an openness to new insights from whatever source. And at the end, and of course, this is the main reason I, I wanted to talk about this today, is they, they did something that the Unitarians never did in their self-description. At the end, they asserted that we have the power the power to make the world a better place. They, they, they said, they said the, the power of people of goodwill and sacrificial spirit to overcome all evil and progressively establish the kingdom of God. And by the kingdom of God, they understood that to match Jesus's phrase. They understood that to mean a, a utopian vision Jesus had of what this world could be like if there were peace and justice. And so my meditation today is just to recite that for you from the beginning and then to be silent with you in a minute. So with, after all that prologue, here it is. This is the universal, this is what the universalists were saying in their congregations every Sunday. We avow our faith in God as eternal and all conquering love in the spiritual leadership of Jesus, in the supreme worth of every human personality, in the authority of truth, known or to be known, and in the power of people of goodwill and sacrificial spirit to overcome all evil and progressively establish the kingdom of God. Neither this nor any other statement shall be imposed as a creedal test. And now let us be silent together to create an opportunity for prayer or meditation. Thank you. 
reading is from the book of Isaiah. It's from 3rd Isaiah. Biblical scholars know that what's called the book of Isaiah was really written in three parts. Yeah, there was a first part, which is about the first 40 chapters by someone named Isaiah. And then about 200 years later, some other prophet whose name we don't know wrote another 15 chapters and just put it on the end of the book. And we call that person 2nd Isaiah. And then a couple hundred years later, a third person added another 10 chapters or so at the end. And that person is called Third Isaiah. So this is from Third Isaiah. So this was written not long before the time of Jesus. And God is represented as speaking. And God is going to create a new earth. God is going to intervene in history and make things better. And what I'd like you to listen to is not so much the good things God is going to do but the bad things that are represented as the current situation. So this is God talking. I am about to create a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. I will delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard or the cry of distress. No more shall there be an infant that lives but a few days or an adult who does not live out a lifetime. No longer shall people labor in vain or bear children for calamity. People shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit they shall not plant and another eat and like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be and they shall long enjoy the work of their hands I don't think Jesus came back from the dead. But I think my car is still parked there. 
but I'm not sure my car is still parked there. What do I know? I mean, Jesus died 5,500 miles away. That's the distance from Fall River to Jerusalem. I looked it up almost 2,000 years ago. If I'm not sure that my car is still there, I certainly can't be sure about what happened so far away, so long ago. But what I do is I make an estimate of probability. I say, is it more likely that a human being came back to life after 36, 36 hours or so after being killed? Or is it more likely that a rumor started? Which is more likely? And I go with the rumor. And uh, I'm confirmed when I think of the death of Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley died in 1977. I can't believe it. That's 45 years ago. I can't believe it. It's 45 years ago. Elvis Presley died. And for years, there were accounts in newspapers of Elvis sightings. People would say, he's not dead. I saw him in the audience at a show. He's not dead. I saw him driving by in that car he liked, and so on. This went on for years. And when he died, there was a death certificate, right? There was an autopsy. <laughs> so if that could happen in the late 70s, surely a rumor about Jesus coming back could have taken place in the early first century, I would think. I think what happened was Sunday morning, Jesus died Friday afternoon. He was executed. Sunday morning, his friends got together for a group meal, as they had been used to doing with him. And naturally, they talked about him. And someone would recall something that Jesus had said once. But most of those present weren't there then. So they were learning something new about Jesus. And someone else there re recalled something he did once. And many of the people at the table had not been there. So they all had the impression they were still learning things about him. And somebody said, it's as if he's come back. Somebody said that. And this went on. They, they kept meeting on Sunday mornings. And other people said, you know, Jesus' friends are saying, it's as if he's come back. And then somebody forgot to say, it's as if. Instead of saying, Jesus' friends are saying it's as if he's come back. Somebody said, Jesus' friends are saying he's come back. And the rumor started. And many of the early Christians had been pagans, and the pagan religions from which they were recruited into Christianity um, had godlike, demigodlike uh, characters who came back, you know, and so on. So it fit in perfectly well with with their orientation it probably I'm, I'm sure it helped the spread of christianity in fact a lot of people who call themselves christians today are christians mostly because they want to believe that there's an afterlife right and they think that that's that that's the central uh, assertion of christianity but it's not um uh it's not even clear that Jesus himself believed in an afterlife. Uh, this, there are only a couple of passages in the Gospels that seem to indicate that he believed in an afterlife. And both of those passages are contested. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of words were put into his mouth after he died by the Gospel writers. The Gospels were written long after. Uh, lots of Jews in his time didn't believe in an afterlife. But the whole party of Sadducees, the the party of Jews who ran the temple didn't believe in an afterlife and made a point of saying. So, well, I think Jesus' resurrection, he is risen, as all the churches say today, is a metaphor 
but it's an important metaphor. Metaphors are both true and false. Um, I said not long ago to a friend, I went out on a limb and told my wife I'd be finished with our taxes by April 1st. I did, by the way, finish my part of our taxes by April 1st. But I, when I told that to my wife, I was going out on a limb. And you know what I mean by that, right? But I didn't literally go out on a limb, right? It's not true that I went out on a limb. But it is true that it felt like I was out on a limb, right? Metaphors are both true and false. You can kill a metaphor. I'm asking you today, don't kill this metaphor, he is risen. A metaphor can be killed in two ways. You can say it's completely true. That's what the fundamentalists do. They say, yes, his body came back. Jesus came back as a resuscitated corpse. Yes, it's literally true, literally true. And they're killing the metaphor. They're saying, they're leaving out the part that it's also false in a way. And Unitarian Universalists have this tendency to kill the metaphor the other way and say, there's no truth to it whatsoever, you know? But we've killed the metaphor if we do that. I don't think he really came back, but his friends really did feel it was as if he'd come back. Um, Jesus' resurrection is real in this sense at the very least. Uh, he's probably more remembered than any person who's ever lived in the history of the world. Here's my definition of Easter. Easter is the day when we remember the period of time when Jesus's friends who were devastated by his execution got together and shared memories of things he said and things he did and they gradually realized that together they remembered enough to carry on his mission without him. To me, that's, that's what Easter is. And his mission was to preach what he called the kingdom of God, or a better translation, I think, is God's empire. God's empire as contrasted with the Roman empire of which Israel was a part. It was a, a utopian vision that Jesus had of how the country would be if it were governed not according to Roman law, but God's law. And by God's law, he would have met traditional Jewish ethical teachings. In the reading today, one uh, part of Isaiah 65 was, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. And that business about the people building houses that are dwelled in by others, the people uh, planting fields that wind up in, in the possession of others. That's exactly what was happening in Jesus's lifetime because of the, the policy. I've said this before, because of the policies of the Romans who were ruling the country, the peasants were being driven off their land. The, the, the subsistence farmers, the poor people who were Jesus's main audience. And, and these, these peasants were terrified because the Romans governed by terrifying people. They were terrorists. That's what crucifixion was. Crucifixion was a deliberately cruel way of executing someone who was perceived to be a threat to the empire and so was to be made an example of. And Jesus was a threat to the empire. From the Roman point of view, his execution made perfect sense. He was a threat to the empire. Uh, the Roman empire was hierarchical, meaning top down, completely top down. It was patronage based, meaning you didn't get ahead by doing a good job. You got ahead by knowing someone. It was slave supported. About half the citizenry were slaves. The whole economy was dependent on the institution of slavery. Um, 
But Jesus's, what he called the kingdom of God, or I think should be called God's empire, it was completely egalitarian. It was a kingdom of equals, rich and poor were equal in God's eyes. Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews were equal. Men and women were equal. Adults and children were equal. Healthy people and disabled people were equal. Powerful people and powerless people were equal. Most of his parables, those quirky stories for which he became famous, are about power relations. There's somebody powerful, somebody less powerful, and there's a negotiation going on. Jesus' friends realized that they remembered enough about him to carry on his mission. Well, even though it's 2,000 years later, I'm a friend of Jesus too. I consider myself a friend of Jesus. Not literally, of course, because I never met him, but, and, and I would guess most of you are too. And, and I too know enough about him to carry on his mission. That is to work to make the world better. But his friends back in the first century, they had an advantage. They really believed in passages like that passage from third Isaiah. I'm not saying all of Jesus's friends, but a lot of them seem to really have believed that God was about to intervene in history and make things better. And, and biblical scholars argue about whether Jesus himself thought God was about to intervene. We don't know what he thought, but I don't have that confidence, right? I don't expect God to intervene and make the world a better place. So I have a question, uh, which is, what's the use? <laughs> what's the use? Look at the headlines, it's hopeless. We can't make a difference. To try is foolish, it's a waste of time. And I try to uh, encourage myself. Uh, one way I do is I read books that are encouraging. I have a book to recommend. Well, it's, it's huge and it's boring, but it, 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 it's, <laughs> I recommend it anyway. There's a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which came out just a few years ago by Steven Pinker, a Harvard professor. The Better Angels of Our Nature, Pinker, P-I-N-K-E-R. Uh, in it, he argues that actually over the last thousand years, the world has been getting better continuously. It's just that because of communications, we don't realize it. Um, he proves, I think pretty convincingly, that all kinds of violence have been continuously decreasing. And the situation is much better than it was 500 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago. All kinds of violence, rape, assault, murder, killing in war, torture, slavery, any kind of violence you name. And he devotes separate chapters to each kind with a lot of statistics and this makes it a really thick book. And this is why it gets boring, because after a few chapters, you say, all right, all right, I believe you. Because, because he proved, and, and, and if you do get the book, by the way, he, he doesn't announce this, but the last paragraph of every chapter is a summary of that chapter. So you can just skip. Um, and, and I know it's hard to believe, but it's because with today's communication, we instantly know about all the world's troubles all at once. Uh, here, here are two examples um, that to me are, are, are on his side. Um, there are something like 190 countries in the world. Slavery is illegal in every one. 200 years ago, that was not the case. I mean, there's still slavery. I understand that. But it's illegal everywhere. I mean, that's progress. It's, it's progress too slow for us to notice in our lifetimes, but it's progress. Uh, or here's another example. Um, the idea of democracy. Even the world's 
dictators today feel obliged to pretend that their countries are democracies. Putin pretends that Russia is a democracy. And of course it's not. But the point is, he feels obliged to pretend that it is. That means the idea of democracy has, has uh, um, convinced the average person worldwide. Uh, if, you're not, if, you, if you're not like me and you can't get yourself encouraged by books, um, just think about changes that have happened in your lifetime, right? Most of you are not spring chickens. So think in your lifetime about the status of blacks in this country or the status of gay people in this, or the status of women in this country, how it's improved just in our lifetimes. It's, it's stunning. And I'm struck by, and I, I treasure that last part of the Universalist Declaration of Faith. That's not specifically part of our heritage because the heritage of this church is 100% Unitarian, but we threw in with the Universalist 60 years ago. So it's sort of part of our heritage. But the last part of the Universalist Declaration of Faith said, we, we avow our faith in the power of people of goodwill and sacrificial spirit to overcome all evil and progressively establish the kingdom of God. They were saying, we believe that the average person has the power to move the needle a little bit, to make the world a little bit better. We have the power to do this. And um, I, I am encouraged by that. And by the way, um, the Universalists had a completely different attitude than the Unitarians toward trying to make the world a better place. The Unitarians uh, had the attitude that to try to make the world better is a duty. It's a duty. The Universalist, it's an opportunity because they felt that if you work to make someone else happy, that will make you happy too. That the, that the most reliable way, in fact, of being happy, of having a fulfilling life is to help other people to be happy. So it wasn't a duty to work to make the world a better place. It was an opportunity. It was a win-win. I'm just about done. On this Easter, <laughs> on this Easter, on this day, when we commemorate the time when Jesus' friends realized that they had the power to carry on his mission, my wish for you and for me is that uh, whether you get your encouragement from books like Steven Pinker's or from your experience thinking about changes in your lifetime or the universalist heritage or somewhere else, wherever you get your encouragement, um, my wish is that you feel in your soul that you do have the power to make the world a better place, at least a little bit. And that working to do so is not foolish or a waste of time or hopeless, but a win-win, a win-win. You make other people happier, and you make yourself a little happier, too. And now, for the support of this church and its work, the morning offering will be gratefully received, and I hope freely given. And Donald will turn off the camera. And if anyone would rather not come forward, I'll be happy to collect <coughs>
This is our time of sharing joys and concerns. The theory is that a joy shared is multiplied and a, a concern or sorrow shared is divided. Now, so as everyone here probably has experienced, I was doing a YouTube thing yesterday, the uh, day before. There was this, uh, I said, uh, David the Lynch. It was about the history of some mills in, in Lowell. And uh, they mentioned that the, the owners of the mills were Unitarians. And that kind of piqued my interest. So I started to do some research. And um, anyway, I, I went down the rabbit hole. Unitarians. And this guy, Michael Silvestus. Silvestus? Michael Servetus? Servetus, okay. Michael Servetus. I guess in Spain he was Servetus, but in the rest of Europe he was Servetus. Okay, thanks. Anyway, he was, he was a genius, right? He was like a, a Galileo type person. He was one of the first ones to map the pulmonary system of, mm -hmm. of a human being. Anyway, he was, so he's credited with being one of the first Unitarians, and I guess he was in a, a disagreement with Calvin uh, at the time. And so Calvin wanted him to be dead. I guess back then, the theological uh, discussions became serious. Calvin was trying to uh, you're on the wrong side. Uh, so they, uh, I guess the Inquisition decided not to, you know, not, not to be dead. They decided to burn him alive on a pile of his own books that he wrote, you know, throughout his career. And uh, uh, his last words, so this is, we didn't talk about resurrection, so I just, you know, I had it. His last, so this is in, this is in, so you guys can just look it up. His last words were, may Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, have mercy on you. And I was thinking to myself, wait a second, you're a Unitarian. Why are you appealing to Jesus? You're appealing to the head guy, right? I mean, I, but, so maybe that was a, you know, a little vacation to uh, Calvin and, and his crew, or maybe it was the Inquisition. Maybe they made it up, you know. They would have made everything up. There's a, so there's I don't know why they made that. There's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of famous atheists about whom there's a story that they were praying to God in their last moment. But, but, well, uh, this, this is what you get from it, though. And maybe the best, maybe the best course of action right, in all of this is just to be on both sides all the time. <laughs> so we're the audience you're with. Just to agree with them. And just be with that, right? And then you never really get into this idea that, and, and then that would go with the atheists at the end, right? You say, if there is a God, please forgive me, you know, I don't know. And if there is a case. <laughs> some of those early, he may have said actually that whole thing. I wish he did. Some of those early Unitarians, it's not that they, they denied that Jesus was actually God, but they thought he was more than human. You know, so he was kind of like an right, angel. Right, we did it the whole thing. And actually, the other thought was like, I was talking about Trisha, right? Because she's Polish. But a lot of that movement came from Poland and Bavaria and that, that entire area, right? The right, right? was John, John Hoos, you know, that yes. whole Protestant movement. But they were serious with their religious convictions. They're, they're not actually our religious ancestors. They're more like our cousins. But, but the, uh, the religious liberals in New England were labeled by their opponents. Ah. And their opponents said, oh, you're just like those Unitarians in England and in, and in Poland. Oh, okay. and, 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 and they put the, in New England, they accepted the name because they did have doubts about the Trinity. Yeah. But that wasn't the central concern. The central concern was to deny predestination. All the Puritan churches believed. Well, the thing on the, on the, just to finish up, I guess, the thing on the mills, well, the way this came down is like, Apparently, they, they initially started to uh, recruit women into the mills from like all of the farmland, like up in Maine. And you know, so this was like this little video about this this little story in Maine. And uh, you know, anyway, um, what they what they were trying to accomplish was bringing bringing all of this this uh, you know uh, labor in, into the mills. And, and they were paying pretty good wages. And what they did is they took some of the wages that they were paying the women and they sent it back to the farm. Hmm. And so it was like almost like an apprenticeship kind of, kind of system. And so it was a, a, a 
mutual benefit kind of thing, but it was just fascinating. They showed these mills back in like the 18, you know, like they had to do these mills that looked just like the mills that we have here, 1840, you know, 18, you know. And I guess we did the same down here, except we used Portuguese and we used the Irish and we used Canadian, French Canadians, you know, so that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The reason we were late is because uh, I was called by Bob Hughes. Uh, he, he's a house poet in uh, New Bedford. He wanted me to section someone who also happens to be a client. And uh, usually, section means I'm sending you a court authority vested in a psychologist or a social worker. To the money fund, yeah. also known as a, as a psychic something. That's against their will. And, and the unusual thing was the guy agreed with me that that was a good idea and that would play into his scheme of things to be sectioned. Uh, and uh, so usually these are not things I like doing. Yeah. Uh, I still don't like doing but it was the most pleasant. Section of the river. <laughs> 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 so, 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 unless you're Easter, I guess I'll like to say. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, oh, Donald. Uh, my joy is, of course, being here today with the people here at the Unitarian Church. Uh, yesterday, <coughs> I was this close to getting hit by a car when I was mm. standing for a bus stop. Standing at a bus stop when a car was keeping right at me, I jumped out of the way, hit the tree, knocked the tree over. I was on the ground, I got up, got it back up, and took off. Uh, Thank goodness, because he was at the gas station with cameras, and the first day I knew that the person was intoxicated. You know, a uh, much elderly man, and uh, unstable on his feet, but when he backed up and everything, and as I got up off my feet to look, and saw the car drive away. A gentleman pulled over in a truck and I got out and asked me if I was okay and a perfect stranger. So I was blessed to know that, that somebody was looking out that from the gas station where the car was at to where it almost hit me, but right here in front of me, not all that would be, slammed into that tree. But he backed up and took off. And I prayed, and I wasn't angry, but I prayed that he would be getting home safely if somebody would stop him before any more danger would happen. Yeah. Um, my joy today, like I say, is being here with you guys on Easter on a special day, and being here with the Reverend uh, Trudeau, and I'm blessed to be here. Thank you all. Anybody? Uh, Steve? Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, as long as Kit may have more information on this, our uh, United States Action uh, is sponsoring a bond <coughs> two weeks from today, on May 1st at 4 p.m., uh, focusing on watching the Ukraine. Uh, it's a 4 o'clock march to begin to the Blessed Trinity Polish National Church, which is on Plymouth Avenue. The uh, march continues to uh, St. Sam's Plus which is a Roman Catholic Polish church, and then it ends on Center Street at, uh, I believe it's called St. John's Ukrainian Church, mm -hmm. it's a very small church, and that's where the watch ends. So there are some that are inclined to walk that far. It's about probably at least a mile to a mile, mile and a half. Uh, what time? Four, four o'clock. Oh, you said, I'm sorry. Four o'clock on May 1st. So uh, I don't know if there are enough people that would uh, Represent the Unitarians. I know we are connected to UIA. Uh, if there were enough people to march, our manner would be uh, appropriate for a part of the march. I intend to be at the end of the march. I'm not walking this is the trek. Um, I'll, I'll be uh, there at St. John's to walk here. Thank you. You probably also said how far that was, but I also spaced it. I don't know if they mapped out the monster. Yeah, I was going to announce that 
Closing hymn number 121, We'll Build the Land. The words come in part from Isaiah, the same book that the reader. <laughs> Ours be a religion that, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the
the good heart, its creed, all truth, its ritual works of love. Amen. Thank you.